songs be a sign that we are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. Cause we are here for you. We are here for you. Tender whisper of love in the dead of 
of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I am never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know.
For every curse, you're the cure. For every sickness, you're the healer. For every storm, you're the calm. For all that's lost, oh, I see. For every curse, you're the cure. For every sickness, you're the healer. For every storm, you're the calm. For all that's lost, oh, what a Savior. And on that cross of Calvary, Every burden has been defeated And every wretched heart redeemed You drown our sins in seas of cleansing Hallelujah, death is beaten Christ has risen from the grave Hallelujah glory and all of darkness cannot tear me and every shackle will come undone my solid rock thine is the key and every shackle will come undone my solid rock is from the grave hallelujah all to Defeated 
and every wretched heart redeemed. You drown our sins in seas of crimson. Today we are back in Colossians chapter 3, so if you guys can make your way there. I've been out for two weeks, as you know, but uh, we're picking back up where we left off. Colos Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 12 to 17 today. I really wanted to cover the whole chapter, but um, there's, there's too much stuff in this section. While you're getting there, let me just give you a quick uh, summary of what Colossians is all about, what we've gone over so far. Colossians was a letter written by Paul, a prison epistle written by Paul to this church in Colossae, a church that had a problem within its doors, within its four walls, and that was false teaching. False teaching had infiltrated the church, and these false teachers, and there, there were several teachings that were here, but really the gist of all these things was Jesus is not enough, okay? So they were pointing people to other stuff. Some were worshiping angels, some were adding the law to the gospel. They were like, don't just carry the cross, carry the tablets, right? So it was a lot of that, a lot of legalism, and a lot of Gnosticism, a lot of hidden knowledge. And what Paul does here in this section, <clears throat> actually in chapter 1 he starts off by, by exalting Jesus as high as he can put him, right? By addressing the supremacy of Jesus Christ, the fact that Jesus is enough, that the fact that we are complete in Jesus, right? Outside of Jesus, we are insufficient, but in Christ, we are more than conquerors. We are sufficient in Jesus Christ. So that's what he does in chapter 1. Christ is supreme over creation, over everything. In chapter 2, he starts getting about talking about the specifics, <clears throat> specific worldly philosophies, specific false teachings, and then he, he, he lays Jesus out there as well, saying Christ is above all these things as well. You don't need that stuff because you already have Jesus. Now, in chapter 3, what Paul does is what he usually does in all his other letters, like Galatians and Ephesians, for example. He starts you off with a lot of doctrine, a, a lot of truths that Christ has done, but then he moves on to duty. And that's what the Bible does, actually. It, it, it's not just um, <clears throat> knowledge, but wisdom. What do I do with, the, with what I've just read? And a lot of the stuff that we're going to look at today are actually listed items that Paul gives us. So things that we need to put on, if you will. And those are the words he uses. Put this on. Put that on. Um, last time we looked at Colossians, we looked at the put-offs, the things that we need to take off, like garments. And that's really the word picture here. Kind of like, we, you know, we, we take off clothes and we put on clothes, but Paul likens it to our old nature. We used to be dead in sin, now we are dead to sin, right? We, we, ha we have a new life, we're a new creation in Christ Jesus, so we need to wear clothes that are, that are indicative of our new nature in Christ Jesus. Does that make sense? So it's been said that, you know, the clothes don't make the man, the man makes the clothes. And that's true, right, when it comes to physical clothes. But when it comes to godly attributes, when it comes to holiness and, and, and really the character of Christ in us, you know, those things do define us. Those things do, uh, do matter. And, and that's the, really, that's the encouragement of this, um, of this section, verses 12 to 17. Uh, next week, I encourage you guys, especially married couples, especially singles that, wanna, that are planning on getting married, and, and parents, <clears throat> come to church next Sunday. That we're, I'm really going to, you know, um, uh, go deep into that subject because that's what, that's what Paul is doing here. He's addressing the church life, and then he's going to move to the home life, to parenting, and then to the work life, okay? So this is the first thing he's going to address. How should we behave among each other as Christians? So the title of this message is New Life, New Clothes. It's really a, the, the, the sermon in a sentence. New Life, New Clothes. Let's pray and, and see what God has for us today. Father, we, we do thank you, Lord, uh, because you're mighty, you, you are powerful, you are sufficient for us. Uh, your word is enough, and, and we are here to, to open it up, but also to open up our hearts to it. So help us, Lord, to, uh, to jump into the word so that the word can jump into us. So, so we can jump into action, Lord, and be, be obedient to it. In, in Jesus' name, amen. So let's begin here. We are looking at verse 12 first. 
<clears throat> now, remember, he's, he's talking to Christians about their behavior among other Christians. And it's not that we, we should be unloving when we are around non-Christians, because the Bible does have its, you know, have, have the Bible does have a few things to say about, you know, loving your enemies and all that. But the context here is really worship, it's assembly and unity. Paul says in verse 12, <clears throat> Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. So he gives us a list of things here, right? But I want you to know how he appeals to doctrine to motivate them to duty. He appeals to the doctrine of election, of holiness, and the fact that we are loved. That's what it means to be beloved. You know, God loves us. So he says, look to God, and because of what God has done for you and I, because of the position that we have in Christ, let your practice in, in life be affected by that. Did you know that this is the exact same thing Paul does in verse 1 of this very chapter? Can we look at that again real quick? In, in, in verse 1 here, it says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ. In other words, Christ is seated in accomplishment, Right? Christ is seated in glory, and because of that, we should live differently. We, we, we should have our, our, our heads in the cloud, if you will. Our heads, we should be heavenly minded, heavenly motivated. Even if our feet are still here on earth, our minds need to be focused on Jesus, His purpose, His glory, His will for us here on earth. Our point uh, three week, two weeks ago, when I taught last, was if you know who you are, you will be who you are. And, and really, this message is sort of a, um, a, a dissection or, or looking at the specifics of what that means. If I know that I am, you know, uh, raised again with Christ, that, that I am born again, that, that my life is hidden in Jesus, then you know what? I'm going to live. I'm going to live that out publicly here on earth. Like I can't say, I can't say, well, you know, you don't know my heart, Okay. Because if I live ungodly and I say, well, my heart is Jesus, and I've, you know, I've, I've been professing to be saved for years, then you know what? I am a contradiction. I'm a contradiction because the, the heart affects the actions, okay? If your heart is changed, your actions are going to be changed as well. That's what the Bible refer, The Bible does not refer to the, to the actual, you know, pumping, blood pumping uh, muscle organ, whatever it is. Um, but... The Bible refers to, when it says the heart, it means your whole being. So if I live like hell, you know what? It's not indicative that I'm going to heaven. I'm probably, you know, deceiving myself. So if I know Jesus, I'm going to put on these things that the Bible says. It says in verse 13, bearing with one another. Why do we need to bear with one another? I thought, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're pretty fun, nice people. No, right? There's, sometimes there's drama in the church. There's drama among Christians. Sometimes, you know, there's people that are not Christians that, you know, they, 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 they profess, but they don't possess it. So the, you're going to need to put on long-suffering, because really verse 13 is the definition of what long-suffering is. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. So as surely and as completely as Christ has forgiven us, we also must, must extend that forgiveness to one another. Verse 14, but above all these things, above, you know, love, above, above meekness, gentleness, long-suffering, and all that, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So the, the, the overall garment that we put on as well is love. So what he's trying to say is, if we do these things, not in a religious manner, if, we, if we're nice because of obligation, it's not really going to last. People are going to know when we're being fake. But when we do it out of love, Paul says, then there's going to be, uh, we're going to be bound up in unity. Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. We are, we are more, we are united in love. That's the idea here about love tying us together, about love tying these things together. That's what Christianity is about. It's a relationship, right? 
Our relationship with Jesus, our vertical relationships should affect our horizontal relationships. So Paul starts off by addressing the relationships within the body of Christ, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the church, right? Whether it be within these four walls or outside. How many of you guys work with other Christians? Raise your hand. A few of you? Okay. Um, so even outside of the home, when you're on other believers, how should we treat each other? Let's continue. Verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. So I believe when we naturally put on these things that God wants us to put on, naturally we're going to have the peace of God. When we choose to forgive, you're going to have peace in your heart. But, but listen, what happens when you choose not to forgive? You get bitter? Yeah, right? It consumes you. When, when, you choo- when you intentionally choose to withhold forgiveness towards somebody else, it affects you. I think, you know, Greg Laurie put it like this, you know, if it's uh, choosing to not forgive is like, you know, drinking rat poison and expecting the other person to die, right? Something like that. And, and that's the thing. It affects you. It, it affects you. And, but when we do the right thing, when we forgive, we have peace in our hearts. And not just any peace, but the peace of God and it rules in our hearts. This word rule was already used in the previous chapter, chapter 2. But there it was used when it was talking about these religious legalists who were trying to umpire their lives. Now he's saying, let God umpire, let the peace of God umpire your life. And it happens when, when love is what we're walking in. Verse 16, the second let here. Let the word of Christ... Dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, the word of Christ. This involves the gospel. This is the gospel. It definitely encompasses the word of God. Do you see the two things that, that, that he's mentioning here, really? I mean, it's, it's worship with singing, hymns, songs, spiritual melodies but also the Word of God. And that's why at Calvary Chapel, you know, we, 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 we reserve time in our worship services to sing to the Lord, to prepare our hearts, right? To surrender our hearts to Him. To him. So when, when it comes time to open up our Bibles and just sit quietly, have these Selah moments, um, we can continue to worship Him by being in, in, in the Word of God. But I want you to notice the, the word that He uses here, let the Word of Christ dwell in you. Okay, this is not just, okay, I read the verses, I'm done, I'm out of here, I'm back to my life, I'll be back Sunday, hopefully, if I don't party too much on Saturday, right? So, no, to, to let the Word of God dwell in you richly means that you, you got to jump into the Word. Sometimes, you know, when nothing's jumping out at me, when I just read the, you know, the verses once or twice, you know what? And that's usually the case. You'll read the Bible once or twice. You'll read the passage and nothing's really popping out at you all the time. So what do you do? Well, you got to jump into it. You got to dissect it. You got to chew on it. You got to meditate on it. You got to pray on these things. And then when you search for the Lord with all your heart, then you're going to see, wow, the Bible's jumping out on me. There's some things that I didn't see the first two times around. I'm seeing it now. And, and that's how it works. We, we got to intentionally seek the word of God. Um, I said this before, but I'll say it again. Um, you know your updates on your smartphones? I don't know if the Androids have them. I have an iPhone. But uh, on the smartphones, when they update, sometimes they give you a big old list of things. I, nobody ever reads them. I just scroll down to the bottom. I hit agree, and the update starts going. Don't treat your Bible like that. Don't just scroll through it and so on. Look for the blessing. Look, look for what God wants to speak to you. Look for the application. And that's what it means for, for, for the Word of Christ to dwell in you richly. Richly meaning, you know, to inhabit you, to live in you. That's, that's, that's what he's talking about here. And I think when that happens, when we allow the Word of God to dwell in us richly, then you're, you're going to find yourself, as the Word is going in, you're going to find out that worship is coming out. You're going to be singing. You, you, you might even be teaching and admonishing one another. Hymns, spiritual songs, and so on. I think that's what the Word of God does. It grows us, right? It grows us, and we become mature Christians. That is the object of the Word of God, to grow us in love and and knowledge of Christ. Verse 17. Whatever you do, in word or deed, whatever you say and whatever you act upon or do, even whatever, whatever you write or text, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, 
giving thanks to God the Father through him. Does that mean, hey, bro, do you want to go catch a movie tonight? Let's go watch the Avengers for the fifth time in Jesus' name. Does, is, that what, is that what that means? To do something in Jesus' name does not mean as a formula, you know, in, in Jesus, you, know you pray. And you should pray in Jesus' name, no doubt. But, but when the Bible lays it out like that, to do things in the name of the Lord, it's talking about to do things in step and in line with the character of Christ. So if Jesus wouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that either. Does that make sense? Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, in Corinthians he lays it out like that, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the Lord, for the glory of God, and so on. Word or deed? And I think this is a good you know, question of introspection, especially if there's things we, we struggle with, and I think we all do, if we're honest. We, we there are certain things that we struggle more than maybe our neighbor sitting next to us. So we need to ask ourselves, is this going to glorify God? Is this consistent with the name of Christ? with the Lord Jesus, with, with his character and the things that he would do. So if it's in the gray, er, gray area and you're unsure, I, I think to be safe, I wouldn't do it. You know, I just wouldn't do it. So Paul lays out a list of, I would say, five things, and we're going to go over them again. We're, we'll just break it down deeper. But he lays out five things here. He talks about forgiveness. He defines long-suffering and all that. And he talks about the peace that, that should rule our hearts. And then Thanksgiving. We should be thankful for everything. I can't have Thanksgiving. You can't have Thanksgiving if you don't know what you have. If you do know what you have in Christ, it's easier to, to be thankful because, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. I have this in my life. I, I recently went, out, went through a... I didn't tell the first services, but I recently went through, through a trial. I, thought, I literally thought I was dying because, um, you know... I chose to Google and check this out and check that out. So, um, and this is in the midst of going to, to summer camp. This is in the midst of, uh, of going to, to the first camp. And, and I got these, uh, these two lumps right here. Um, and I was checking out, you know, the first thing that pops up on Google is lymphoma, which is, you know, cancer and all that. Or it could just be your, your you know, your swollen lymph nodes. You could be fighting a virus or whatever. But, you know, in my mind, I was like, well, if this could be something deadly, then I want to check it out. So that was just consuming me all week, even at camp. But through that trial, as being, being, um, being in worship, pr praising the Lord, I'm like, Lord, I'm like really worshiping God, right? If you feel like, if you think you're gonna, there's a possibility of you do, you're going to die, then you're, you know, you're, you're going to worship God as best as you can, right? Like, Lord, spare me, right? I'm too young. got four kids. Um, so, so I'm worshiping God, and, and, and I'm doing it with the, there, there's a deeper uh, affection there. The, there's a thankfulness that I did not have before. I started to appreciate more what I had. I started to appreciate more the things that I neglect so often. Because it's easy sometimes, and I'm, I'm sure women do it as well, but it's easy to just go on Facebook and avoid putting your face in the book, right? It's easy to neglect your, your little children and do this and that if you think you, you still have a lot of time left. And so I was like, Lord, if, if, if this is not it, if you spare me, I'm going to be a better father. I'm going to go on Facebook less or, you know, and do this and that. So anyway, long story short, I, I come back um, Monday. I, I get a, a CAT scan and a, a ultrasound here. And they said it's called uh, lipoma. It's just fatty, non-cancerous lumps. You can take them. If they get too big, it's a cosmetic thing. So you can, you can take them off if you want to. So I was, I was praising the Lord. I was thankful for God. But it's easy to just get in the flesh. Oh, well, what, what, remember what you said, Albert? You, you said you're going to be better and you're going to do this and that. So it's important that we keep coming back to the Word of God, that we allow it to dwell in us richly or else we're going to hit neutral again. We're going to forget. We're going we're gonna to stop being thankful for the things that we are so blessed with. So I encourage you, don't wait till some trial comes your way, but be thankful now. Acknowledge these things because we really, really don't know how long we're going to be here. Um, our life is but a vapor, the, the Bible says. So I have seven things for you guys to write down. The number one is your clothes will define you. Your clothes will define you. The, the spiritual things that we put on will define us will either say that we don't really know Christ or that we truly do know Christ. Bob Utley, a com Bible commentator, put it like this in reference to election. Election cannot be isolated from a believer's responsibility to act. In other words, we are elected 
for something to act. Paul appeals, and I'm looking at verse 12 here, Paul appeals to who they are in Christ or what Christ has done for them so they can know what they can do for the Lord or in light of the Lord, right? So he, he appeals to their election, to God's choosing of you. Did you know that if you, if you uh, have trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you are born again, you are referred to as chosen, as elected. And, you know, Ephesians chapter 1 it's, is a deep, deep um, chapter which talks about the work of the Father before time, election, predestination, God's choosing, the work of the Son and coming to redeem His elected, His people, and then the work of the Holy Spirit, sealing that work till the day of redemption. It's a beautiful chapter on, the, on salvation, you know, how we, are, we have been um, saved from the penalty of sin, and we are being saved from the presence of sin currently, right? Excuse me, power of sin currently, and, and a glorification when we get our new body, whether it's when we die or when the Lord comes back, that's glorification. We're going to be saved from the presence of sin. There would not be sin in heaven in the presence of Christ. So all this to say, your election, my election, the holiness that the Bible refers to as being appropriated to us should cause us to act, should cause us to be different people because loving activity reveals living identity. That's our, our first point. Loving activity reveals living identity identity. In other words, because you are chosen, because you're a child of God, because you are set apart, put these things on because they fit you, right? They fit you. If I try to put on my old clothes when I was 15, and if you know me, I, I used to be real skinny growing up. People made fun of me all the time. So gaining weight for me was a plus. Now I'm having trouble losing it. But gaining, gaining weight for me was like, you know, my family used to make fun of me. Are you anorexic? Are they, Cynthia, are you feeding him? And and um, if I wear my old clothes, it's not going to fit me, right? You putting on the things of the old nature no longer fits you. It doesn't go with who you are now. Therefore, he says, you are holy. You are beloved. You are uh, chosen. So put this stuff on because this stuff fits you, right? It fits you. Loving activity reveals living identity. Our clothes define us. And guess what? The way you and I treat each other, the way you treat your, your neighbor here, your brother and sister in Christ, is, is a way of proclaiming Christ to the world. Okay? That's one evidence of being a true disciple of Jesus. He says it in John 13, 34, and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. For three years he was with them. For three years he showed them how to love. That you also love one another Notice, by this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. See, our character is indicative of our election, of who, who we are in Jesus Christ, if truly we are disciples. And did you know also that the love that we have, or that we exert, um, is being perfected? Love is perfecting us? It, it's a deep theological thought, but it, 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 it's in the scriptures and, and I, w I believe that the, the way that that happens is as we grow in the Bible, as we are sanctified, we, as we look more and more like Jesus, our love is going to be perfected in that sense. So it's not, it's not because, you know, well, Albert's so, you know, so moral, so upright, so good, but because Jesus living inside of us is just being revealed to, to the world, right? Election leading to perfection in, in that sense. It says in Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his, his son. Christ is good. Christ is, God is love. He is perfect. So when we don't grieve the Holy Spirit, when we don't quench the Spirit, when we walk in holiness, we reveal Jesus. When we reveal Jesus, we're going to reveal that perfect love of his. 1 John 4, 17 and 18 lays it out more specifically. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Huh? As he is, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, so are we in this world. So I can't say, and I don't like, I mean, it's true, we're not, we're not, I'm not who I used to be, and I'm not who I'm going to be yet, right? We're all in process. 
But I don't like when people say, well, I'm under construction. Because usually the people that say that, or the people that say I'm not perfect all the time, usually say it in, 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 a, in reference to some justification, some sin that they want to continue to do. That's usually the case, and you know, some of you know that. Um, but the reality is that our, the, Jesus says, be perfect for my Father in heaven is perfect. Be holy. Be complete in this sense. And I think the way we do that is through love, not in the flesh. Because your loving activity reveals your living identity. And that's why it says here in verse 14 in Colossians again, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. There are those two words again that John uses, love and perfection. Love perfecting us. And I think this is sort of like um, a jab too at the religious leaders here that were infiltrated in the church because they were saying works perfect you. Talking to the angels, hidden knowledge, this stuff is going to make you who you need to be. And, and Paul's like, no, it's, it's, it's Christ who's seated. It, just look up and, and, and just love. Number two, you got to dress yourself. Your clothes define you, but you got to dress yourself. The Lord is not going to put these things on for you. It, listen, if, if we didn't have to do anything, Paul would let us know in his word, right? In the word of God. The Lord would let us know through Paul. But because he says, put these things on, that means there is responsibility, human responsibility. And that's how it works in the scriptures, you know. You have God's sovereignty, and then you have human responsibility that should flow from the uh, proper understanding of God's sovereignty. So you and I, we got to dress ourselves. The Lord lays out the spiritual wardrobe, what we need to do, but we, we're responsible to put it on. Does that make sense? I'm responsible to not be mean to people, okay? I'm responsible to to walk in mercy, to walk in kindness, to choose to love others. Notice Jesus never said, if you feel like it, if you've had your first you know, cup of the day, then you can, you, you're allowed not to be grumpy at your spouse or whatever. No, we're not excused. We're not excused because we have Christ in us. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives inside of us, right? So, so it's important that, that we understand that, that we put on our own clothes. Think of it like this. we got to put on what God has put in. You have to put on what God has already put in. Position versus practice. So here's the question. What is inside of us? Who is inside of us? Jesus, the Bible says the Holy Spirit as well, the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? So this is how it works. I know because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. I am not myself. I've been bought at, the, at a price. The Bible says that Holy Spirit is inside of me, right? He's not renting the place. He owns the place. He's sealing us till the day of redemption. But Paul says in Galatians, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So there is the possibility of having the spirit inside of us, but being kind of carnal, walking in the flesh. I know at least in my experience with the Lord, when I'm not in the Bible, when I'm spending more time in other things that are not edifying, I get more cranky, I get more selfish, you know, and I'm not exhibiting, exhibiting the, the, the fruits of the Spirit in my life. So then, practically, I got to put on the new man. Positionally, I know in Christ I am seated in the heavenlies now in a very real sense, but you got to put on what God put in. We got to put on the Spirit, we got to put on Christ, and that's our holy character. See, these two guys are not here today, but um, Victor and Ricky are Dodgers fans. I know they're Dodgers fans because they wear the Dodger hats, they wear the jerseys, uh, they post stuff on Facebook. Um, I saw you know, Victor on his phone uh, at camp up there and he, uh, his screensaver was the LA Dodgers as well. I know they love the Dodgers because they put on the Dodgers, right? The world is gonna know that you love Jesus because you put on Jesus. And I'm not talking about a Christian t-shirt or a bumper sticker. I'm talking about these godly characteristics. So when you're moral, when you are kind, when you exhibit these characteristics, you're exhibiting Jesus, right? You're exhibiting his kindness, his love. If Paul wanted to summarize this chapter in one sentence, he would just say, put on Jesus. Put on Jesus. And that's really what he's trying to say here. You got to put on what God put in. Number three, be compassionate. This is where we're starting to look at our list now. Be compassionate. The New King James renders it tender mercies, to put on tender mercies. I like how the New English translation puts it. Clothe yourselves with a heart of mercy, a heart of mercy. It's not just, 
um, it's not just you know empathy. It's not just a feeling. It, it's an action that proceeds from you know from a knowledge, from an understanding. I believe. Somebody put it like this: compassion is taking sympathy and doing something about it. Okay, taking sympathy and doing something about it. Am I sympathetic to others? Am, am I compassionate? Do I have tender mercy? And the root here is mercy, by the way. Mercy and grace are married in the scriptures, or they're found together often, but they are not identical, but they go together. When, when, um, when Christ saved us, we got grace. Grace is a gift, unmerited favor. That's what grace is. Grace is, is, is getting what you don't deserve. We didn't deserve it, right? Mercy is the opposite side of the coin. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve, right? You're going to heaven, but you're not going to hell. That's, that's mercy. You're not getting what you deserve. You're not getting God's justice, God's, God's wrath, because Christ took that. So when he says be tender, you know, mercy, give mercy or be, have tender mercies, it, it involves that. It, the question is not, well, does this person deserve it? Because often don't we do that, especially in marriage, you know, 50-50. Well, he didn't give me flowers for Mother's Day. Or, you know, he, you know, she didn't buy me, uh, or she got me the same stuff that she always gives me for Father's Day, right? Um, then I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to react to what she's giving me or to what he's giving, right? That's not how the Bible teaches love or mercy. Mercy has nothing to do with whether you deserve it. Mercy is like, actually, because you don't deserve it. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose to give it to you. And that's what he says here. Among the body, we need to be merciful. We need to have tender uh, mercies towards others. Now, I was at camp for two weeks, so I'm going to have some, some camp stories real quick. Um, when I was at camp this last week, um, I was walking through a grassy uh, field plain right next to the cafeteria. The cafeteria is like two, you got to go upstairs and there's like a balcony thing. Anyways, there was this kid as I'm walking through the bottom here above me. He, I don't know what he had in his hand. I don't know if he had a soda, he was shaking or something of the sort. But I noticed through the corner of my eye that he wanted to throw it or he was pretending like he was going to throw it. And I looked up and I said, you know, uh, I will go up there. And... Uh, <laughs> And the kid says, the kid says something like, I'm hoping you do. And, uh, and, um, and I was thinking, I need to go over there and, you know, teach him some respect. So, so I was like, no, I don't want to be chasing a, you know, 13-year-old up here. Um, and I'm glad I didn't because later on when I did get close to him, um, you know, he, he, he was special needs. He had something sticking out of his head. Um, and I'm glad I didn't do that. Then I felt compassion for him, you know. And so, so you start off with mercy, but then sometimes the feelings come, the, the compassion comes. And, and you know what? Sometimes we, we think we're being merciful to somebody, and really they're being merciful to us. And, and the Lord exhibits mercy towards us. I mean, how many times has God refrained from disciplining me immediately? And that's what he's talking about here. God has given us mercy. We should extend that mercy to others as well. That's what tender mercies is referring to. Definitely empathy, definitely sympathy. You know, people are going through stuff that maybe you haven't gone through, but your spouse has. Maybe you can't be there for that person in the same way as somebody else who's lost a child or has gone through a divorce or things of that nature. But our job is to be sympathetic. Kind of like Job's friend. You guys know Job? I, I, <clears throat> I avoid Job, but, uh, but Job, you know, he goes through the worst of the worst situations. Not because he messed up, but because he, he did things good. And, you know, God loved him. He was a righteous man. He lost everything. He lost his children, his property, everything. And then he's got these three friends. At first, they do, I think, a good, good thing. And they, all they do is just they shut up and they just sit down with them and they are there for him. And I think that's one way to show tender mercies, to show compassion. Sometimes you, you can't say anything. You can't say anything. Just be there for your friends. Just be there for someone when they need you. And I think this naturally translates into kindness. Does Paul have to say this? I think he does because I think sometimes there can be a lot of mean Christians. We can, we can be that person that we do it. We can be that type A type of a person that we're, you know, we're always right. We, we were outspoken about the things that we believe. You can't teach us anything, right? You can be that, that kind of person, and you can come off, come off very unloving. So I understand for the type A type of people, that can be a little bit more difficult. 
But in Christ, it is possible to be nice, even if you diff have a different type of character. So be nice is, is the next one here. Paul says, put on kindness. It's not excusable to be rude, to be, um, to be somebody that is mean-spirited. You know, I joke around with, with some of the guys here that, you know, we're, I know them. I, 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 there's freedom in that. I can text them certain memes and things of that nature. And I know they're not going to get offended. And their responses don't offend me either. So there's got to be kindness. There's got to be wisdom. But don't, don't make somebody else the butt of your jokes. Because that's different, right? There's a difference between laughing together and laughing at someone. And, and also, you can be kind, but just make sure that, you know, some people don't want to be touched. Some people don't like hugs. Okay? So make sure that you don't force yourself on people as well. Because, see, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 13 there, 1 Corinthians 13, love does not seek its own. Okay? So as we love people, as we're kind to people, let's be considerate. Let's, let's walk gently around them, which is really the next thing here. Somebody put it like this. Kindness is spreading sunshine into people's lives regardless of the weather. Sometimes all people need is, a, is a, just a word of encouragement. Right? A word of encouragement. Sometimes one word that you can give to your neighbor here in church can be just as powerful as, as you know, a, a message. Not to reduce anything of the word of God, but the reality is sometimes a personal word is very, um, you know, very a word of encouragement. Right? Things of that nature. People need that. Because just like James says, you know, the tongue is powerful. It, it, it can be poisonous. You, just as easily as you can tear somebody down, say something mean and, and just destroy their weak. You can also easily build them up by something you say. Now, nah, you don't have to lie. You don't have to be fake, but something true, something edifying. I think we all need that as a body of Christ. The next one is put your interest aside. Put your interest aside. This is really um, a byproduct of humility. Paul says put on humility as well. Humility literally means to lower yourself. It is seen in the life of Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, I believe, where it says that he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, that he, you know, um, he came down, he became a man, came in the form of a bondservant. He humbled himself, the Bible says. So humility is putting others before you. I know you guys have heard that a lot of times. Maybe it's your first time hearing this. But did you know that during this time, humility was not a virtue for the world? Humility was a virtue for a godly virtue here. There was no other synonyms for this. In this world, if you were a man, everybody else was under you, okay? Everybody else, they actually lived in houses. The houses in the Roman world were this way. Some were two stories. So the, the husband, the father would live in, the, two, in the, the, uh, the upper room alone. He would sleep there. The wife and the children would sleep on the bottom floor. That was the idea. And children were considered property in, in generally in the Roman, Greco, Roman world. So, you know, if, if times got hard, you know, you could sell your, your child into slavery and get, you know, to make ends meet. Again, this is not, this is not the, the, the Christian world. This is the context of when Paul was saying these things. And he's saying, be humble. Put others before yourself. So I, you, I can imagine some people walking out of the church service when, Paul, when this letter is being read, read out loud. Because humble is like, well, this is de definitely counterculture, a countercultural um, idea all this to say as christians we have we cannot be entitled people we cannot be um conceited we got to work on that stuff right if we have any of that stuff we got to make sure hey i'm nobody i'm nobody i get to serve the lord right if, if you serve here you know you, you're you're serve, if you're a leader here excuse me you're a servant leader we're servant leaders right we serve each other and that's what jesus is talking about here excuse me paul to serve others. And sometimes it's easy to focus on what other people, people are not doing. And, and I've, I've walked into this mistake where I'm just, man, why didn't you do this? Well, how long did they become a church here? Why didn't they serve? And, and then I, I, I lose my joy, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, I do a poor job when it comes to my service to the Lord. Our point is this. If you're focusing on what others don't do, you're going to miss out on what you could do. See, when the disciples were bickering about who's number one, 
who is the best, right? Jesus gets down, takes off his, he puts, he, you know, takes off his garment there, and he uses that to wash their dirty feet. So while they're trying to find out who is the best, Jesus is showing them who is the best. And just like he said, the, gra- the, the, the least of, of you shall be the greatest of you. So it, it's a servant-like attitude. So my job, and I think our job as Christians, is to seek to put others first, put our interests last, and put the interest of others first. That's what humility uh, looks like. At least that's one facet or one face of humility. How can I put my interests aside, and how can I serve others? Look at what Peter says. All of you, be submissive to one another, and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So if I struggle with pride, <clears throat> I need to inten- be intentional about getting over myself so I can get under God and serve other people. If you want more grace in your life, you know how you get it? One way at least? By serving others, by putting the needs of other people before yourself. That's, that's really what we do when we get down. Humble people get down. Humble people get down and serve others, and they open them, themselves up to the grace of God. God gives grace to humble people. Grace is not just a reference to salvation, but a reference to, to, um, to God's gifts, to God's blessings. We're, still, we're, we're getting grace from the Lord. So when I'm being mean, let's say to my wife, the Bible, Peter also says, you know, husbands, treat your wives with respect, lest your prayers be hindered. So if I give Cynthia the silent treatment, God is going to give me the silent treatment, okay? And that's really what it comes down to. It's not that God doesn't hear my prayers. It's that God is not going to answer my prayers because of how I'm treating his daughter. Does that make sense? Likewise, I believe there are, there are things that, like how you treat your neighbor, how you treat your brother and sister in Christ. Bible also says, Jesus says, hey, leave your, if you got beef with your brother or sister, leave your gift at the altar, go resolve that, and then come back and worship me. Because it's kind of hypocritical, right, to say to, oh, yeah, Lord, I love you, I surrender, thank you for forgiving me, but I'm over here on the side, still mad at that person, still not forgiving that person. We can't, we can't do that. We, we, we shouldn't do that. Let's, let's be humble is what Paul says. The next one is walk in gentleness. Or meekness, if your Bible says meekness, you know, that's what mine says. Uh, but walk in gentleness is the idea. This word meekness does not mean weakness. It, re- it actually, I think it refers more to strength under control. It was used to refer to animals who were domesticated. Think of a horse, a wild horse. You can't just ride a wild horse, right? It's going to kick, it's going to be difficult. It's going to kick you off or throw you off. So there's a process of being domesticated, and that's the idea here. The opposite would be an uncontrolled person. Uncontrolled behavior is not godly. It's ungodly. We saw it when, the, uh, when Moses comes down with the, with the two tablets, right? The, did you, there was two sets of two tablets, by the way. He comes down. What are the people doing? They're, they're dancing there. They're worshiping a golden calf. They're out of control. He gets mad, he breaks the tablets. In our flesh, we are out of control. But the Spirit of God is a control. He is controlled. The Holy Spirit is, 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 is orderly. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He wants things done in order, in order, and orderly. He is God. So when you and I are walking in gentleness and meekness, it's not that we don't have power, it's that we have self control. Self-control. Be gentle to other people. Don't impose, impose yourself on other people. Our, our, our point is this. A meek person is not a weak person, but a strong person under control. A strong person under control. That's what Paul says. Did you, did you know that Ephesians chapter 5 is very similar to Colossians chapter 3? At least the last section here. In Ephesians 5.18, Paul says, Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he's giving a contrast here. What does wine do to you? It gets you out of control, right? When I was a kid, I didn't like myself because I was quiet, because, because um, you know, I just, I just hated myself, my personality. So when I, when I started drinking, well, I was a different person. I did the things that I was afraid to do, and I got more f- people that I thought were my friends. It gets you out of control. It gets you into the flesh, right? And you do things. Man, why did I do that? Well, you did that because you were under the influence of, uh, of alcohol. 
But when we are led by the Spirit, we are orderly. We are under control. We can say no to sin. A meek person is not a weak person, but a strong person under control. So, so how, does that, how does that translate with us? Well, that means I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be gentle to you. I'm going to be kind to you. Jesus was gentle. We know that, right? Jesus was a gentle man. He had all the power in the world, but he chose to be gentle. Okay? Maybe the guy that is dogging you at Walmart, maybe you can beat him up. Maybe you can't, right? But the choice is, regardless of what that person is doing, you, you're going to be gentle because, because of Christ in you, right? So you put that old stuff. You put that old, that old stuff away and, and you be meek and gentle. Christ had all the power in the world. You know, when Peter cut the, 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 the officer's ear off, Jesus didn't just put it back, but, or, you know, fix that, his pro fix Peter's mess. He says, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. But then he says, don't you know that I could pray to my Father in heaven and I, a, a legion of angels will come? Jesus had the power, but he, chose, he willfully chose to be gentle and under, and under control. And that leads us to the next one. We must suffer long, our last one here. Suffer long, I, um, I don't need to define it because it defines itself. Suffer long, that's, that's what it means, suffer long. Some Bibles say patience, but I think it's more than patience. It's being able to endure under difficult circumstances. It's more than waiting in a long line at Starbucks, okay, or behind a slow driver in, in, in a single lane. It's more than that. Long suffering deals with, really the, the, in the ministry, it deals with, uh, you know, when, when you need it, right? When everything's going good, when everybody likes you, and people are, you know, are just growing and things of that nature. When your kids ain't sick, it's easy to just be happy. But when things get difficult, that's when we need. Long, that's when we're going to see if we have this long suffering. And, and Paul says, "Put it on." So that means I, there's a will, there's a choice here. There's something I'm going to have to do. But listen, verse 13 defines this. How do we? How do we? How does it look like to put on long suffering, bearing with one another? So you bear with me. I'm at 47 minutes, two minutes over my usual time. So you bear with me as I'm going, finishing this up. But bearing with one another is, is intentional here because sometimes there's going to be people that are going to annoy you. Sometimes there's going to be people that, that are going to do stuff that are going to hurt you. And really this happens as you, as you get more plugged into the church. Yeah, you, you know, as you get closer to people, you're going to see their imperfections. You're going to see their warts and all. And that's what happens in marriage, by the way, not to discourage anybody. You know, you, you, you love the person. Usually when, when you're, when you're, um, when you're dating or courting, you're, you're not really being real with each other. I mean, you're, 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 you're the person you're pretending to be that you, you want this person to like, and you're this person over here. But when you get married, when you get married, you start seeing the real person. When you find yourself behind traffic together, when you find yourself with two kids, when you don't pick up your mess, when you, you know, then you start to, then you understand you got two sinners that you brought closer together. And... And you start seeing the warts and all, so then we must suffer long even in marriage. If you don't believe me, read Paul's letter to the Corinthians um, chapter 7. He's like, I wish you guys were like me. I'm single. That's what he said. Because there's going to be trials that are going to come with those things. But the idea is this. We need to suffer long with each other. We need to bear with one another. We need to forgive one another because forgiven people need forgiveness too. I need your forgiveness. Because I'm going to say, you know, sometimes not always behind the pulpit, but um, face to face, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I might say something that's, you know, I'm sure I'm gonna say something that's, that's wrong or not do something that I probably should have done. Maybe I didn't, you know, call you when you got sick or whatever. But there's always got to be the, this this extension of grace because God gave you grace. Give grace to other people. Give grace to others. That's what really this comes back to because He says, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But what about if the person doesn't want to repent? What about if they keep on doing it? Is this, um, you know, get out of jail card for anything? And I, don't th I think long-suffering means that. Suffer long, but really when other people are being affected by flat-out sin, then obviously that there comes a time where you need to, hey, you need, this, is, this has been going on. I've been giving you grace, but it's time to address it. You're hurting other people around. You're hurting yourself. So yes, there's a time to address things of that nature. Read Matthew chapter 18. If you got a problem with another brother, first go together. If the person doesn't want to repent, bring it to you know the elders or another witness and so on. 
of course, there's church discipline. There's things that need to be hashed out. But for the most part, we need to have an extension of suffering long. Suffering long. When I was at camp for the high schoolers, our group was smaller, but they usually bunk you with uh, other churches, other Calvary chapels. So we got bunked with uh, Calvary Chapel. Uh, it's a church in Las Vegas. Anyways, they had like 20 boys there, 20 high schoolers. So when it's 11 p.m., it's lights out. Lights out means quiet, no talking, right? And But these boys kept talking, kept being rowdy and loud and just saying things that, you know, you don't want to hear. And and I was wondering, I was like, where are, the, where are the leaders at? It's midnight already. These guys are just saying obscenities and, and all that stuff. So I think the leaders maybe put on earplugs and they just they just checked out. Um, but I was hearing, my boys were hearing, hearing this as well. But in my, as far as the way I do things, my philosophy is, okay, give them a chance. Give them grace first, give them grace. Till after they were, you know, just saying things very loudly, just not caring about their neighbors, right? So I turn on the lights, I get up, and I start walking over there. And then that's when their leader happened to get up. And, uh, and I was like, hey, you know, these, they're saying these things, you know. And, and then after that, he, he apologized, he talked to them, and, and they, they went to bed. But, it, but it's like that. It's like, don't let your first thing that you, want, that you need to do is justice. I'm just going to give him God's justice, God's wrath. First, extend grace and mercy. And if there's no change, well, then go, go, go and do what you need to, what you need to do. Because, see, even Jesus, right? He told Peter, get behind me, Satan. Even Jesus, I'm sure... When, when Judas was like, we could have sold that bottle and, you know, given the money to, to the poor, right? Jesus is like, leave her, let her alone, right? I think Jesus yelled that out to Judas, in my opinion. Leave, leave Mary alone. Either way, there was times where Jesus got real, right? We made that whip of cords and he flipped over the money changers' tables. But that wasn't the character of Jesus all the time. And that's how it needs to be with us. There's a time... 90% New Testament, 10% Old Testament. Does that make sense to you, right? Forgiven people need forgiveness to walk in grace, walk in forgiveness. And lastly, it says, you know, he refers to a complaint. What does complaints have to do? If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Do I have complaints? Do you have complaints? I'm sure you have several complaints. If I, if I could think of any complaints... I'm sure I could find one complaint for each and every person that I know, every believer. But you know what? There's a difference between having a complaint and go, going and giving that complaint out and taking it to the prayer meeting and praying for that person, right? Or gossiping or slandering that person. No, the Bible says, forgive as you have been forgiven. People are going to have complaints. You're going to have complaints, but we need to leave them there. Keep those things to yourselves and give grace to others. Give grace to others. And that's really what this message comes down to. Putting on Jesus, putting on God's love, and just walking out in that within the body of Christ. Love your enemies. There's a context for the world as well. But among us, the world is going to know that, that we truly are his disciples when we, when we exhibit love um, for one another. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you again because it, it is powerful, Lord. It is active and sharper than a double-edged sword. It, it goes on and, and it carries your message and it accomplishes its purpose. And I pray, Lord, that, um, that your word would continue to, uh, to do its work in every heart here that knows you. But I also pray, Lord, that if somebody here does not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that you would open their eyes, that you would open their heart, that they would trust in you, that they would believe your words when you said that if we confess your name, that if we believe in you, that if we repent of our sins and just trust in you and your finished work, that we can be saved. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God rose him from the dead, we will be saved, your word says. So if that's you this, this uh, morning and the Lord has pricked your heart and you want to receive Jesus, I pray that you do that today. All you have to do is trust in Jesus, acknowledge that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior. And He is here for you. He's wait that's, that's the only guaranteed prayer for the, for the unregenerate person. The prayer of, of, of a calling out. The prayer of save me, Lord. If that's you and you want to trust in Jesus, I pray you do that now. And you can say something like this. Lord, I'm a sinner. 
I repent of my sins now. Come into my life. I believe that you died and you rose again from the dead. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. I pray that you fill me with your Holy Spirit and that you help me to walk out in your holiness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together.